Thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, so what I want to try to do is go through stomach anatomy a little bit. I have a lot of questions of well, what's the stomach and what's the blood supply and how do you decide? How do you decide what kind of operation you get? The whole stomach, part of the stomach, what are all these lymph nodes? And do they do it differently in Japan and Korea than they do in the United States? What about robotic and laparoscopic surgery? Are, am I a candidate? And, and then also palliative. Even if I'm not potentially curable by surgical resection, is there a way that I can eat again as I'm going through chemotherapy? What are my palliative options? And then the other thing is, after surgery you've heard, what's life going to be like? I mean, what's dumping syndrome? What, how do I do with this? And so these are the kind of things that I want to try to go through. So I'm going to start off with a case, and the reason I pick this case is one of the things is how did I get involved in stomach cancer? I started Vanderbilt August 15th, 2005, and this is my first patient I saw there. Um, 55 year old female presented with heartburn and painful swelling. You've kind of heard these stories. Actually, she was lucky in that she actually, um, nine days prior to seeing her, she had undergone an endoscopy, which revealed a mass in the stomach, and biopsies are consistent with stomach cancer. And these are the CAT scans here. I don't know if I have a pointer, but you can kind of see this thickening it's stomach in, in there, right? But I don't know if it'll, it's not going to, yeah. yeah, I don't think I can see the screen. So you can see this sort of stomach thing in the middle, um, kind of right to the left of the, uh, uh, left of the spleen there. Um, and if you look at these other, some very thickened stomach um, involving the pancreas, the spleen, et cetera. So, her CAT scan showed thickening lesser greater curvature of the stomach and extension of the pancreas and the spleen. A big deal. We talked about what kind of therapy to do. Um, she wanted to do upfront surgery, which in 2005 was reasonable, and this is what we did a lot. Went in with the camera, no spread, took out part of her esophagus or stomach or pancreas or spleen or diaphragm, adrenal, etc. Um, a big operation, which sometimes this is what it takes. And, you know, this is her initial pathology. Um, margins were negative, involved, et cetera, big tumor. And this is one of the things, that, and this is important from patient standpoint. So five of 16 nodes positive, and I said, well, that's impossible. We did an extended lymph node dissection. There's no way we got less than 16. We had to have more than that. And this is an important point. So I had him look at it again, 51 nodes. So, and the point there is, is that this upstaged her. You know, she had five of 16, now she has 12 of 51, and that can impact that. So that's something to think about when you go and get treated, you wanna to go to a high volume center. It's not just the surgeon or the medical oncologist. Pathologists play a very, very important role, as do radiologists, and that's one of my main points. So she underwent her adjuvant therapy, and this is the great thing is that I get a Christmas card every year. The last one is in December 2016, so now it's been 11 and a half years. Um, she had stage 3C. Um, and I know there's stage four survivors as well, and she's enjoying her grandkids, no one's a recurrent. So, um, I mean, one of the reasons I got into this, and again, it's kind of a ceremonial as I leave Vanderbilt, uh, as my first case was of gastric cancer. So, as you know, a lot of you know, third leading cause of cancer death worldwide. Over, it is declining. It's interesting, one of the questions I always ask my residents and medical students is in 1950, stomach cancer was the number one cancer in US males. It's now dropped. Why is that? And you can thank General Electric, actually, because of the refrigeration. So prior to, you know, after World War II, prior to that, how, what do we, how do we preserve meats? We salted them, it was in brine, it was a lot of the nitrites. It's an interesting study that once refrigeration became common, the incidence of stomach cancer went down. Um, and so it's a, a neat epidemiologic study. However, we are having a little bit of more of an increase now in these proximal, these GE junction tumors, uh, a lot because of heartburn, obesity, et cetera. So it is coming back. And you can see they're certainly endemic in Asia and uh, parts of uh, South America as well. Um, Shown here is, and you've taught, and I'm not going to go through a lot, that the survival, and, and it's so dependent on stage, and that's the important thing here, and you've heard these stories where if we can diagnose stomach cancer early, survival rates are excellent. Yes, there are survivors with 3C and 4, but obviously the majority are higher up, and I think that's one of the important things for us is, you know, we would like to, all cancers, shift all these diagnoses to the earlier stage, because certainly cure, even with surgery alone, 
is significant, and that's our goal as medical professionals. So a little about stomach anatomy. I'm going to try to do this without a pointer, but um, this is the stomach. Um, you can see at the top of it where there's that GE junction where a lot of tumors now, where the esophagus joins into the stomach. There's little lower esophageal sphincters you can see there. And then you'll hear terms like cardia and fundus and body and antrum, and, and so this gives you an idea of where it is. The other thing is that the, the diagram on the left shows the very, very rich blood supply. Stomach has five blood supplies to it, and you can see there. Anyone want to take a guess of how many the stomach needs to survive? Or there's five, short gastric, gastric blood, et cetera. Any guesses? One. That's the right answer, one. It's a very vast organ, and that's very important in terms of what we can do. We can resect a lot because, yeah, the stomach only needs one of those five blood supplies to survive. So it's a very robust organ that way. And there it is. It looks like a bag, purse, et cetera, storage of, of food before it goes toward the pylorus. What's nearby? Well, you kind of heard from that patient, you know, all these other organs that are nearby, and there it is, stomach, and behind it's the pancreas and the spleen, and that's important because oftentimes that, or sometimes that's involved, and there's the liver and the gallbladder, so that's kind of the area of the body that we're talking about. In terms of staging, I think the important thing here, and I'm not going to go through a lot, the, the important thing here is how do we, because this is surgically relevant, as we're talking now about minimally invasive or endoscopic resections, it's the T stage. And what T is the thickening. So you can tell it stomach cancer is largely staged by not necessarily the size of the tumor, but the penetration of the wall. So you can see these HGD is what we call high-grade dysplasia, the step before stomach cancer. That's great. If we can diagnose that, oftentimes in a polyp, et cetera. Then we're talking about T1, where it's just in the inner lining, and that's something also that we've made some inroads in terms of doing endoscopic resection. So right through the scope, instead of going to the operating room, you can take that tumor off, and I'll show you a couple of pictures of that. Done very, very commonly in Southeast Asia, where there's a lot of screening. And then as it gets bigger, more resection into other organs, and also a higher lymph node. So that's kind of the how we stage, and, and you know, again, this is how the, the stage goes from the green, which is the lower stages, all the way to the red, and it, it matters. So, and the thing that thing is up is that these are questions that you ask your physician. You know, a lot, most common things like, well, what stage am I in, and how do you stage stomach cancer, and et cetera, and so this is kind of a, a, an idea of how we do that. So what are the surgical issues? Diagnostic laparoscopy taking a peek with a camera. Um, do we do it? Why do we do it? How much do we resect? This is probably the biggest question. You know, why do you have to take my whole stomach out? It's only the top part. Um, how are you going to re- how, how do you live without a stomach? I was given a talk to this in, in, from my uh, seventh grade class, my, my son when he's in seventh grade, and about like what I do as a cancer surgeon. And, and the kids were amazed that you can live without a stomach. That was like their biggest take home. It didn't matter anything else. All that mattered was how can you live without a stomach and how do you reconstruct this? What about the lymph nodes? We hear all these lymphadenectomy and do I have to get 12 nodes or 50 nodes or however? And then what about this minimally invasive uh, and, and who's a candidate? So in terms of laparoscopy, why do we do a laparoscopy? Well, I mean, and again, when you're doing it, minimally invasively, it's a little less relevant, but before, for the majority of patients, especially with advanced disease, there's an incision. Well, before we do that, we want to take a peek. Um, with the camera, make sure there's no spread, because if there is spread, options are different. So it can be done outpatient or the same time, but that's why we do this. And it actually is significant. About a quarter of the patients, it detects disease that we can't see on the CAT scans, which is the only reason we do this. And when we are, we, are, we look around, we take some biopsies, we also do washings that you may hear, where we kind of put fluid into the abdominal cavity and then take it out and send it to pathology, and that helps. Because if, for example, patients have spread of tumor cells outside the stomach, we may give them chemotherapy prior to even thinking about surgery, because these patients are at higher risk for recurrence. So that's one of the reasons that we, we do this laparoscopy. And this is a picture from... Uh, colleague of mine at MD Anderson, Brian Badgewell, who uh, just what it looks like. You know, you can see the stomach is that bulge on the bottom there, and then the liver's up in the left upper quadrant. And again, we took a look around, and, and in this case, there was nothing there, but just as an image of what it looks like by the camera. So what are my goals of resection? Well, this is kind of oncologically sound, meaning got to get the cancer out. Does not, as I tell patients, it does not help me 
or help you take out 99% of the tumor. This is all or none. We'd like to have a decent margin. So this is the big thing you'll hear about, margins. Well, you know, we want ideally five or six centimeters, two or three inches, but at least an inch or so. And that's relevant because when you're up near the esophagus or lower down, there's other things that are nearby, and that's important of why we have to take out other things. And what we call on block. So if we need to take out part of the pancreas that in her or the colon or spleen, we do it. As long as we can get all the tumor out and it's localized, it's something that we should do. That's our goal. Low complication rate. Obviously, we, you know, we want to get you through the operation that you do well. Uh, and then leave as much functional stomach as possible, and that's why I highlight functional. Um, one of the controversies in taking out these tumors that are up high is, well, why can't you just leave the lower half of the stomach, or the lower third? Because you do it the opposite way, but the lower third doesn't function as well without the upper, and I'll show you that. And that's the reason that a lot of times we have to take the whole stomach out because even though it's taking the whole stomach out, it doesn't do you any good to leave part of the stomach that doesn't work. You know, the side effects are miserable from that. So gastrectomy, subtotal versus total, partly versus the whole thing. How do we decide? Again, margins are important. Type, these intestinal tumors, these Southeast Asia type tumors, the ones that were more common in the 50s, they're lower down on the stomach. We can do a partial. These diffuse cancers that are in, involve the entire stomach, the, typically the CDH mutation tumors, et cetera, that's the entire stomach. It's not very safe to leave some behind because there's a very high risk that there's tumor there. Those we do in total. And the location, again, if it's down near the bottom, fine. Upper, it's a little controversial, but typically because the top part of the stomach is very important in terms of function, we oftentimes take that. Uh, and again, we want to come in about, uh, if we end up coming very close to that junction, we often have to take part of the esophagus. And I'll show you some schematics of what that looks like. So, proximal versus distal is what we're talking about. The light pink is the, is the area. So if you have a tumor up near the GE junction there, that, that one on the left, you know, to get a good margin on that stomach, and remember the stomach, the way the shape is that there's a lesser curve, the shorter curve on the left, and the greater curve. And so they get a margin, you can tell it's going to be difficult to save more than about a third of the lower stomach. It's just not going to work well. So we take the whole stomach out um, in that case. For the one on the right, where the tumor is lower down, to get a margin, yes, but even that top part of that stomach still functions, and therefore we can leave part of that top stomach. And that's one of the differences, that it's all about location, where the tumor is, and helping us decide what do we do. I'm going to come up with some terms now that I don't think are in the Bill Roth one, because these are things like, what's a Bill Roth? And, you know, how do you reconstruct? So this is, on the left, you can see where the tumor is. Now, this is a tumor right near the end, near the pylor area, pylorus area, and, and we take out part of the stomach. And the easiest thing is, well, you have one end of the intestine, and the other end of the stomach, just hook it back up together. Makes sense. It's the most physiologic, and that's the Bill Roth one. We hook one to the other. The problem with this is, is that it has to reach. And oftentimes, if we have to take a lot of stomach, there just is not enough room. But that's what we call Bill Roth one, so in case you hear that. Ask this to your, you know, how are you going to hook me up? They'll be amazed if you, well, if there's a one, there's got to be a two, right? So then, what's the Bill Roth two? And, and, and again, a little bit hard without a pointer, but this is the typical one where we take out more than a half of the stomach, about two-thirds of the stomach, and now the two ends just won't reach. This kind of where, you know, you can see beyond the tumor in this A won't reach. So what we do is we bring up a loop of intestine, and we just hook it back up. And so now... You can see with the arrow, food goes into that stomach stump and then down your intestine. And then this, the bile and the pancreatic juices come around and kind of meet it. And that's very common, what we call a Bill Roth II. The problem with this is that, as patients will attest to, um, one of the complications is bile reflux. Because that bile, that green stuff that's irritating that the stomach hates, comes through that loop and can reflux back into the stomach and the esophagus. And that's a problem. And so. Uh, we don't like doing this Bill Roth II for patients unless we have to take just a little bit of stomach. So this is my least favorite hookup. And then what, ruin what? You hear this ruin why? What's the ruin why? Why are we doing this ruin? That's what I, that was my, uh, this is my favorite question. Why are we doing the ruin? Um, so what that is, is that when you take it out, in order to prevent this bile and, you know, this 
the C and the D. And the important thing here is we basically bring up another loop, and it, you can look at the intestines, it kind of looks like a Y, where you look at the C and the other one. And so then we bring up a loop of intestine, uh, and so that the food goes down and the bile goes down beyond that. You can see kind of the BD and down. So the bile does not come up that rule limb into the stomach and the esophagus, and that's why we do it. And that's most, probably the most common hookup for uh, subplane, certainly for total. And so same thing, this ruin Y, we take the whole stomach out, we have to hook the esophagus up to the intestine, and we can hook it up directly, or we can hook it up with that little pouch, and that little subset. Which one we do, it really doesn't matter. I mean, uh, I have to admit, I used to do the pouch reconstructions for years, and then if you look at the quality and the eating, they're about the same. Um, if you look at most studies around the world, whether you have a pouch or no pouch. But again, something to ask, do you do pouches, why, why not? Um, the theory is it gives you a little bit of reservoir, like a gastric bypass, but um, to be honest, the side effects and everything seem pretty similar. So it's more just surgical um, preference. What is D1, D2? This is the other big thing I know you've heard, and this is a worldwide controversy that none of us can agree on. But it's, again, important to ask your surgeon, well, what is a D1, what is a D2? So this all started in, you know, and again, in Japan, Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, um, tremendous amount of stomach cancer. Uh, and they've done a tremendous job of really defining all these nodes. And so uh, a very intricate nodal dissection that the Japanese do and the Koreans, et cetera, because they're so used to this. Um, and what we know is that there's level one lymph nodes that are around the stomach. And then there's these level two lymph nodes that are beyond the stomach. And how many lymph nodes do we take out? I and mean, you have lymph nodes all over your body. You know, for colon cancer, we know we should take out at least 12. What about the stomach? The stomach, like I said, is a rich blood supply, is a rich drainage. And so this is where it's been a little, con do you take out just level one? Do you take out level two nodes or D2, when do you, et cetera? So that's kind of that controversy. So because it's very complicated by all these nodal stations, um, a study was done looking at, let's make it simple for the Americans. Let's say, let's put it in numbers. Instead of saying there's 12 different stations, let's just try to equate, you know, if you get 15, it's equivalent to a D1, and that's what it is. And if you get 26, at least, it's a D2. And I, I, don't, I, mean, I can answer this later in terms of how this was developed. But, and the reason I put this on, as you saw from my patient, that when I do a D2, and they only look at 15 nodes, that's, to me, it's a surgical quality issue. And so this is also pathology. They have to look at it on lymph nodes because it makes a difference in terms of how you stage. Um, and again, I'm not going to do medical on this, but I just want to go through why there's still a controversy. There is a European group, uh, I'm sorry, an English group, that looked at this and D1 versus D2. It works great in Japan and China. Let's try to see if it makes a difference here and there was no benefit in survival, and it was a lot more severe in terms of patients, in terms of mortality, so the chances of dying, and complications. The Dutch tried it, and this was a very interesting group in that the Japanese proctored this, increased mortality. Again, patients died more often, and no difference in survival. So is it really worth doing? When they did a long-term 15 follow-up, however, those patients that got extended lymph nodes actually had less recurrence in cancer. So yes, there, if you get through the tougher operation long-term-wise, there's a potential benefit. And then the Italian also did this, and then this is more modern, and said, hey, wait a minute, if you do it well, actually there's no difference in complication rate. So we should do it for everybody because there is some survival in some patients and that. But of course, long-term there was no difference in survival. What's the bottom line? There is a benefit in patients with positive lymph nodes and patients that have large tumors. And the problem I say is that we don't, we don't know if you have positive lymph nodes, so you have to take them out. You can't look at a lymph node and say, there's cancer in that. You could biopsy it and say, yes, but how do you know it's negative? So the safe thing to do is to do this extended lymph node dissection on everybody. Oops. It's going, is it on its own or is it? So basically, that's what's recommended for everybody. Ask this question, are you experienced in doing extended lymph node dissection? Laparoscopically open, robotic. This is something the surgeons has to be able to do. And shown here is a picture, again, uh, from the operating room. Again, it's a little bit hard, but this is a subtoe. You can see the two staple lines. Maybe you can see it on the left-hand side. You can see that pink. Well, that's the 
beyond the pylorus. All that yellow stuff is the pancreas in the middle, and then that stomach is up there. But that's what it kind of, again, it's a little hard to show that the pointers, but that's what it should look like when you take out part of it, and then also when you take out the whole thing. And, and again, I can show you these slides later if you want. Pointer. What about endoscopic therapy? You know, what about going in with the scope, just like patients get diagnosed, and then going ahead and taking it out that way. And this is how it's done. There's a little early stomach cancer. So then very early, in that, just in that top layer of the stomach, going with a, a different devices, um, with heat, et cetera, and basically scooping that polyp out. And you can see kind of in D that you leave this little crater. And then and kind of like a, a biopsy. It's an extended biopsy. And, and that's how we do it. And that's uh, very, very good for early stage. These are the requirements. Has to be a very well different, so a very low, lowish grade tumor, only in that only in that first layer. Because if it goes beyond that layer, the chances of lymph nodes are higher. Because again, with this, we can't take out any lymph nodes, so you want it to be an early, and so no one any of these high risk features, and that's really critical. So again, in the U.S., and also has to be a very small. This is not very common. I mean, if we had, you know, in terms of diagnosis, but we do it, and there's centers that do it here. It's just, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of patients. In, patient, in places where there's a lot of screening, like in Southeast Asia or South America, earlier diagnosis, this is much more common. And again, also no ulcers. So these are kind of the candidates. But, you know, something to ask if you have an early stage cancer, ask your physicians, hey, am I a candidate for this mucosal resection for the scope, or do I have to go to the operating room? And again, also this. What about minimally invasive resections? Laparoscopic, robotic. Um, Frank had mentioned he had a lap-assisted robotic gastrectomy. Uh, what are the advantages? Well, smaller incisions, less pain, perhaps better outcomes, maybe not, up in the air. This is a laparoscopic picture. Instead of having, let's say, a single incision being up or down or side to side, there's multiple smaller incisions. So certainly pain control, and you can probably attest to that, um, and that's important. We know for early stage disease that there's equivalent cancer outcomes, meaning that in experienced hands, if you could take the same number of lymph nodes out and in a short-term data, it's probably similar. The problem is it's a steep learning curve. Uh, this is not an easy operation. And you know, in places that do thousands of gastrectomies a year in parts of the world, sure, they're very good and they do the extent to take out 50 lymph nodes robotically. In this country, it's very hard for most surgeons to do that. I don't do, I do early stage, I'll do that, but anything that needs an extended lymph node dissections, I'll be honest, I don't do that because, you know, if I did a thousand a year or so, I could get good at it, but with this mortality and outcomes, et cetera, the patients, if you look at how they stay in the hospital, the complication rates, they're not any different, and so therefore I'm gaining the incision, but it's a tougher, longer operation. So um, limited centers in the U.S., and certainly something to ask. Um, but there are a few centers in the U.S. much more common in, in higher areas. What about palliative options? So non resectant why would you operate if you can't take it? Well, bleeding, obstruction, pain, um, and these are our options. Sometimes we take out the stomach for bleeding. Usually not a total because that's a lot to go through, but it is. It definitely provides some benefit. Patients can eat again. They can tolerate the chemotherapy. Sometimes we can bypass these patients. In other words, there's are obstructed, we can do a bypass in the operating room, oftentimes with a feeding tube. You can eat again, tolerate chemotherapy. Uh, and so there's different types of options for, even if you're not, quote, resectable, other type of options. And then the other thing now are stents. Again, going in, this is a patient, for example, that has an obstruction there, and go in with a camera, put in this expandable stent, open things up, and again, allow patients to eat. Uh, and obviously tolerate their chemotherapy, an important option now in certain places. And I want to talk a little bit about post gas This is probably the most common questions I get. Well, now what? i am lost the stomach. And how does this work? Well, you disrupt things, you take the nerves out. It's all dependent on how much you do. And 25% of the patients have, and I'm sure a lot of you can test to this, have some sort of post-gastrectomy syndrome. One to 4% are pretty severe and debilitating. Um, so still a significant, and this impacts on the ability to get chemotherapy, uh, obviously quality of life, it's an important problem. Anemia, that's probably one of the more iron, and it's usually due to iron and B12. Why? Because, and vitamin D and calcium, because the stomach has, uh, although it doesn't absorb a lot, 
it certainly has something to do with iron B12 and vitamin D. So patients are oftentimes on B12 shots or iron and supplements. So supplements are very important. All my patients see nutritionists both before and after surgery, and they follow up with the nutritionist so that we're all on the same page in terms of supplements, vitamins, et cetera. Weight loss, you heard about, uh, usually about 10%. Most of the time it's three to four months. It's usually fat. Uh, lean body mass is unchanged. The importance of nutrition, uh, et cetera, to go and to, to help with that. Dumping, 25% dump, that's my most common. What is dumping? About a quarter of the patients experience some symptoms. Usually it revol resolves with time. Although, you know, one to two percent will have debilitating symptoms over time, and one percent we have to somehow fix it surgically. And what it is is it's basically you eat food and all of a sudden it doesn't sit there, it goes right into your small bowel. And it's divided into kind of early and late. Early dumping is, 10 to 30 minutes after you eat something, you feel this like clamminess and lightheadedness that's going through you. Why is that? Fullness, nausea, diarrhea, belching. And we think that that's, and also with heart rate, sweating, dizziness, some of you may have experienced these symptoms. And this is really by rapid fluid shifts. All of a sudden you have this big, what we call osmotic load, and it just goes in your small intestine and, and there's a bunch of fluid shifts. So this is really, you know, treated with frequent small meals. We talk about separating the solids and liquids. This is why we ask patients to do liquids separate from solids. You don't have a lot of liquid food going through you. And that oftentimes help with early dumping. What about late dumping? And this is that insulin-based thing. A couple hours after meals, now all of a sudden, it's less common than early dumping. And what happens here is that you get this high carbohydrate release into the small intestine. Again, the stomach is a reservoir. It empties periodically. It allows the pancreas and other insulin to catch up. When you don't have that, all of a sudden you flood your body with carbohydrates. Your insulin levels go way up. What happens then? Your blood sugar goes way down. And again, dietary modifications, frequent small meals, avoiding high carbohydrate meals. Have your pasta but then don't get tiramisu that meal. <laughs> tiramisu maybe for lunch, and then have your pasta for, you know? So things like that. Think about you know, trying to separate. Doesn't mean you can't, you, you wanna be able to eat the food you want. You just have to be smart. Smaller portions separating the high carbohydrate meals may help. And there's some medications that you may hear about as well. Bowel reflux, like I said, much more common with Bilra too. I hate that reconstruction, I don't do it, um, but it can happen. And it occurs late, often a year after. The most common thing that people do is they get put on proton pump inhibitors. Well, I mean, I've had patients that don't have no stomach that are on PPIs, which makes no sense. It's bile. It's not that. So that doesn't help. Um, you get burning, you get pain, nausea. You can get the scope again, and they have to see this red, ruddy esophagus that's typically for bile. And there are. We have bile binding agents, things called well call, cholestyramine. Um, to help bind the bile. Uh, and in some cases, particularly if it's a Bill Roth II, we have to go back in and redo it, um, where we curd it into this rule limb so that there's lack of bile. But that's you know kind of the other things with bile. But don't, if you have bile reflux and it's truly bile, you don't need to be on an antacid. So I know I've gone through a lot and I look forward to the panel discussion as well. Um, but surgery is the only option to quote cure, although there's stage four survivors that are gonna argue me with that, and that's great, but for the majority of patients, it's still the main option, and obviously the earlier the diagnosis, the better. We'll hear a little bit about the other therapies that go along with it. How do we decide depends on multiple factors. Location, margins, how aggressive the tumor is. The goal is get it all out. Don't get 99% of it out. Get it out, get it out safely. Extended lymph node dissections are recommended, and in experienced hands, there's no increase in complication rate. We know that. Minimally invasive techniques, same thing, experienced hands. It's not for everybody, perhaps for the earlier um, patients, what its advantages are still up in the air. There are palliative options, so just because you're not resectable does not mean that surgery can't, there's still not a role for some sort of surgical therapy. And again, we have post-gastrectomy syndromes, but we, they can be treated, so don't ignore these, you know, I mean, they can be debilitating, but we have options for that and we recognize that. So I want to thank you. This is um, uh, a picture of Vanderbilt, where I am, and uh, as most of you know, I'll be moving on to uh, University of South Carolina in Greenville. So thank you again. Thank you very much.